Black holes remain one of the most mind-blowingly intriguing phenomena in the universe. Just what are they? How big or small can they get? And what would happen if a human being got swallowed by one? Misconceptions and myths surrounding black holes abound, and in her new book, Black Hole Survival Guide, astrophysicist Professor Jana Levin tackles the astounding physics behind these mysterious cosmic objects. This episode, I got the chance to speak to Professor Levin to find out what makes black holes tick. I'm Jana Levin, and I'm a professor of astronomy and physics at Barnard College of Columbia University. I'm also director of sciences at a place in Brooklyn called Pioneer Works, which is a cultural center. A um, little bit unusual project, but really exceptional um, collaboration of bringing arts and ideas and music and science together under one roof. Um, it's really been quite inspired. <laughs> and uh, my work does scientifically tend to focus on, on space-time. So I'll work on anything from extraspatial dimensions to the Big Bang, to black holes, to theories of, uh, of, of the multiverse. Um, it just sort of depends on, on what mood strikes. <laughs> <laughs> cool. I mean, yeah, the, what we're going to be speaking about today is um, black holes, because uh, around about the time this podcast comes out, your your latest book will be out, which is uh, the Black Hole Survival Guide. Um, yeah. Yeah. Could you tell us a little bit about the book I mean, and kind of what it's... Sure. Yeah. I, I'm, the book is, it's very, it's a very small, literally like pocket guide. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's meant to be um, a beautiful little object. A, a lot of the um, excitement I have still for the book, even though as a writer, you know, you kind of burn yourself out a little bit, is because a very close friend and artist, Leah Halloran, has done um, 23 original paintings for the for the book. And, um, and it really became fun to collaborate with her and to think in this kind of dreamy way about visualizing the book. And the book very much talks about um, about black holes, but I think it, it's one of the funny things that people think they know everything about black holes, and then you start pressing, and really, um, really, we have a lot of complete misconceptions about black holes. So it's sort of it's sort of dispelling dispelling that, and and then speaking about the stuff that I find really fascinating, the really theoretical aspects of the of the phenomenon. Fantastic. I mean, you mentioned it was sort of a short pocket size. Pocket science book was, was it difficult to, to fit all that theoretical physics into a pocket science book? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you know the famous um, Mark Twain quote: "I didn't have time to write you a short letter, so I wrote you a long letter instead." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes, it takes work to write a short missive, and um, and so yes, a lot of what went into this was paring down and getting to the substrate and making it really lean, but I hope um, still having a musical rhythm of writing. And um, so that was kind of a pleasure, though. It's, it's always more fun to kind of pare away than it is to have to build it up in the first place. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. I mean, it, but perhaps it's, it's worth doing that at the, at the start of this podcast. Um, yeah, would you, could, like, could, you, could you just give us a summary? Like, what, what actually is a black hole? Um, what, how do they form? And what and what do they do? Yeah, so I think um, one of the misconceptions people have about black holes is they think they are the way that they were formed, and um, and and that's not necessarily the case. So here's an example that I think people are familiar with: the idea that there is a star and it's a very heavy star, it has a short lifetime, it burns through all of its thermonuclear fuel, and then it begins to collapse under its own weight. And it does no longer, it no longer has the pressure to support um, its weight, and it, collapse, it collapses catastrophically to form a black hole. Now, right about here is where people think, well, that means a black hole is a very dense object. But it's not really an object. If you go up to what we call the black hole, um, there's nothing there. <laughs> it's empty. <laughs> the stuff is gone. So what we really mean by the black hole is the event horizon that's left behind almost as an archaeological imprint on space-time after the matter of the star has continued to collapse. And that empty region, it has a name because it's, it's the region, as many people have heard said over again, uh, beyond which not even light can escape. So you have to be traveling faster than the speed of light 
at the event horizon to escape the event horizon. But that's all it is. It's really a place. I, th- I say black holes are more of a place than they are a thing. They're a place in space-time. <laughs> and they're a place where light can't escape, so it casts a shadow on the sky. And that's really what we mean by the event horizon. In fact, Sir Roger Penrose uh, recently received the Nobel Prize precisely for proving that it is inevitable once this event horizon forms that the material of the star must continue to collapse. It has no choice. It can no more hang around the event horizon than it can travel at the speed of light. And so the star continues to collapse, leaving an empty nothingness behind it and creates possibly a singularity, which may or may not happen. It may, the singularity is this idea that the curvature of space-time is so extreme, it's actually infinite, and matter runs into the singularity. It's literally a hole in space-time and ceases to exist. And that's such a, such a terrible <laughs> anathema to physicists who believe that the world should be knowable and that, 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 that there's, there's meaning to the future. And um, so most people, including Penrose, said, oh, that singularity itself probably doesn't exist, but the event horizon for sure is left behind, whatever happens to the rest of the star. And so when we talk about a black hole, what we really mean is that shadow of the event horizon, more than anything about the interior. Now, the reason why I say it's not, uh, we shouldn't think of them only as dead stars is because that's just one remarkable way nature thought of to make black holes, which was to kill off a few stars. But um, but it's conceivable black holes were made in the in the Big Bang in the early universe that they were microscopic black holes um, that were not at all these huge astrophysical objects. Um, it's possible they formed uh, later big supermassive ones from direct collapse out of a diffuse primordial material. So um, so we shouldn't only think of them as dead stars. Yeah, that was one of the things I was I was going to ask you was um, that idea. Um, of of black holes being being microscopic, so do do we know just how small they can be, and also how how massive or how large they can be? Yeah, um, I recently I actually have to kind of remind myself the exact number, but they could, in principle, in principle, just theoretically, um, be as as big as the observable universe, right? There's really no limit to how big a black hole can be. It doesn't have a turn off mechanism, mm. as long as it fits inside a region that's causally connected, meaning, you know, you can't really make a black hole from two parts of space and time that have never at least been able to exchange a light signal, right? They, that you can't make an object bigger than that. So, so that's the observable universe. Now, the biggest black holes we actually see are about in the 50 billion times the mass of the sun range, um, which is pretty big. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, indeed, that's pretty big. Um, but we don't know that there's any reason why that those couldn't get bigger. Um, so the smallest ones are probably weigh about a thousandth, a few thousandths of a sesame seed, which might, which, which might not sound very, very small because subatomic particles are much larger less heavy than that, much, much less heavy than that. However, it would be a staggeringly small fraction of a proton across. So another misconception people have about black holes is they think that they're huge. And the point of the black hole is actually that it's small. They are, um, they're physically spatially small compared to their heft. So if I took something, the mass of the sun, the sun is was one and a half million kilometers across, and I made it a black hole, it would be six kilometers across. So really, the idea of the black hole is that it's spatially, physically, incredibly small. I mean, that would fit in Central Park, right? (laughs) To be New York-centric. Pick your favorite park in England or the UK. Um, and, uh, And so even the supermassive black hole that's four million times the mass of the sun in the center of of our Milky Way galaxy, it's it's less than 20 times the width of the sun across. So um, so that's very that's a lot of mass to pack into a very small space. Indeed, yeah. I mean, it's interesting what you were saying about, you know, um, kind of misconceptions, because one of the, um, I had always heard of, heard black holes described in terms of uh, escape velocity. So you have to be yeah. traveling at a certain um 
um, speed in order to be able to escape their gravitational pull, but um, that, impl- that yeah. implies it's like a solid object, like a planet, doesn't it? That implies it's like a That's planetary right. body or something. You, you, and, and, it, and it's still an accurate way to talk about it. You can say if I was standing at the event horizon, falling through, and I was shining a flashlight, um, just as I crossed the event horizon, the light would not be able to escape because you would, at that space spatial point, have to travel faster than the speed of light to escape the black hole. But it, but it does not have a surface. So you're escaping from a, a region, but not an object. And, um, and it really is completely empty space there. As you cross the event horizon, you will not encounter any matter, any material. You will be free to float across. In fact, if you choose a big enough black hole, it shouldn't be a particularly unpleasant experience at first. Um, it, people are surprised. They think, oh, a big black hole must be stronger, must be more dramatic. But it's kind of like standing on a basketball where you really notice the curvature of the basketball versus standing on the earth, where you really do not notice the curvature of the earth. And so the bigger the black hole, the less you kind of notice that you're falling through this curved space time. Um, And it's kind of an unspectacular experience. Now the photon, the little bundle of light that you emitted as you crossed, could actually get stuck right there at the event horizon. It just, it, it wouldn't move relative to the event horizon. Now you would still perceive it as traveling at the speed of light because you can't sit still on the event horizon. You fall through, and as you're falling through, you think that photon has passed you at the speed of light, even though it's still stuck on the horizon. It's literally stuck there. (laughs) One way to think about it is like the photon is trying to move at the speed of light against a waterfall of space-time, and so it ends up just not moving at all. (laughs) So when you say, um, like, falling through, um, where would you actually end up? If, if you well, were that, to... that's probably pretty bad. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, if there is something like a singularity, even if the singularity itself goes away, so how would it go away? People were people were saying things like the singularity is predicted by general relativity, Einstein's theory of curved space time, but but that that prediction fails right there at the singularity, and some quantum paradigm will repair it. And, and there's a lot of conjecture about that. Does it get blown out into another universe in a white hole? Does it end up with some kind of quantum remnant? Or does something really crazy happen? Like there are wormholes, entangled wormholes connecting the interior of the black hole to the exterior of the black hole. I mean, there's all kinds of wild suggestions out there. But it really won't save you because by the time as you approach that, that point, Uh, the way you have to think about it is not that you're falling towards the center of a sphere, but that the singularity is actually in your future. It's almost as though space and time, which we talk about being relative, uh, for somebody outside, let's say in a space station orbiting the black hole, trying to see what happened to you, um, that their measures of space and time and your measures of space and time have become rotated relative to each other so enormously that what you're measuring as time, they from the outside presumed was the center of a sphere, a point in space. But for you, it is actually in your future. And you can no more avoid it than you can avoid the next instance in time. So there's nothing you can do once you're inside that black hole to save yourself. You are going to go towards that um, singularity, whatever quantum remnant has replaced it or quantum phenomena has replaced it, and you will... um, you will be flayed and shredded. What happens is the part of your body that's approaching the singularity, even fractionally before the other part of your body starts to get pulled apart. It's also that the whole space-time is converging really strongly towards this point. And so you are getting pummeled as well. And basically, um, it's like almost like a storm in space-time that you have created by being there and you would be ripped apart and flayed and turned into your subatomic particles and that whole uh, that whole debris would rain into um, whatever your peculiar fate is at the very center. <laughs> if, it is a, if it is a white hole, which I don't really believe it is, but it's one of the more fun ideas, meaning that the the singularity in the center is really sewn on to a Big Bang singularity, so that what you have is as you approach this moment in the future, it's actually a Big Bang. It's, it's an event. It's an experience of a creation of an entire universe. And so from the outside, however big you think the black hole is, maybe you think it's 60 kilometers across, 
but um, but it's actually as big as an entire universe on the inside. <laughs> I think the the um, the physics is, uh, behind it is just so mind blowing that it mm-hmm. it kind of makes me. Um, I, I wanted to kind of go back to something you were saying there about um, you know it being predicted by Einstein in his theory of relativity. I mean, mm-hmm. how could he have known or how could he have predicted that the, the, they exist? Yeah, actually, um, strictly speaking, he did not. And that's one of the really interesting aspects of the history. Um, Einstein publishes his general theory of relativity in 1916. And within about six months, uh, Carl Schwarzschild, who was a friend of his, an astronomer, um, who had enlisted uh, in the German inf- as a German infantry soldier during World War I, wrote him from the Russian front where he had been reading um, the proceedings in which Einstein had published this theory. And he, within that six months, solved for what we now call a black hole. Schwarzschild did not uh, call it a black hole. It wasn't called a black hole for another 50 years, a half a century later. But um, but what he did is he said, well, just imagine um, the mass of a star concentrated to a point. He didn't ask if that was feasible. He didn't ask how you could possibly do such a thing. He just said, imagine it. And then he solved for the mathematics in the context of Einstein's theory for the curved space-time around such a point. And he derives all the fundamental elements that there exists, the event horizon, although it took a long time for people to really understand what it was, um, the event horizon, because it looked very strange. It looked like time stood still on this location, but the time isn't really standing still. It's just that the light can no longer get to you. So if you see an astronaut sending you signals as they cross the event horizon, there will be a last signal that you will be able to receive from them. And so it's almost as though they're frozen there for you. You you wonder what happened to them. Um, But uh, Einstein thought this was very clever. He was really impressed that the, such a simple solution existed for the curved space-time around. It could also be a star. You don't have to get all the way into the event horizon, the shadow of a black hole. It actually also describes the curved space-time that the Earth experiences when it orbits the sun far away. Um, but he said nature would protect us from their formation. He didn't believe they were real mm-hmm. or that they would exist in, in, in nature. And that was a reasonable reasonable supposition. I mean, after all, it's very hard to crush things. <laughs> uh, you know, we can't crush things to black holes. I can't, I can't take a, even like something soft and uh, a sponge and crush it to a black hole. It's impossible because the matter resists collapse. Matter pushes back against it. And it really wasn't until people were studying the nuclear physics um, that was actually necessary to go into the bomb project, the Manhattan Project, um, that they understood that, in fact, even the nuclear forces could not resist complete catastrophic gravitational collapse if the initial core of the star was heavy enough. And, um, and so black holes started to become a possibility in reality as, as the death states of stars. And that was not really something people took seriously until the late 60s and 70s. Um, and that was when John Wheeler, uh, who was the great American relativist, who basically educated the entire first generation of relativists, he's the one who just coined the term black hole. He just started started using it, which was kind of his way, and it stuck. <laughs> so, yeah, so uh, was that around the time that we actually got confirmation that they exist? At what point was it, it was actually still kind of little- irrefutably confirmed? It was still a little early uh, when Wheeler said that. 1967, he said it. In the early, in the 60s, people started to see quasi-stellar radio objects, which we now call quasars. And they weren't sure what they were. One of the suggestions was maybe they're formed by the collapse of a really heavy black hole a, a million times the mass of the sun. We don't really think that in, anymore. We now know that we were, in fact, seeing black holes back then, but not their formation. We were seeing black holes that were spinning up big magnetic storms in the centers of galaxies and creating a lot of havoc around them. And that's what we were really seeing was the havoc that was created around them. Um, But um, in the 70s, people started seeing these very bright X-ray sources. And and by what they deduced was, was what they were seeing was basically a black hole cannibalizing a companion star. 
and that the x-rays were coming from the material of the companion star splattering on the black hole. Um, and even this was contentious for quite some time. I mean, it wasn't impossible that there were still some people in the 80s who weren't sure the black holes existed. And, um, and of course, we, this century has been remarkable in terms of discoveries for black holes. We've heard black holes collide through the LIGO experiment, which won the Nobel Prize in 2017, the architects of that experiment. Literally space-time ringing like mallets on a drum, you know, when the black holes orbit like mallets on a drum, literally recording the sound of that, which is just nuts. Um, and we have this wonderful image of the black hole that was taken by the Event Horizon Telescope, an actual picture. And that is the first time people were also surprised they're like, what do you mean we've never seen a black hole? It's like, well, technically we've never seen one. We've only seen the indirect consequences of one. And so this was this, was this beautiful image that of, of a supermassive black hole, billions of times the mass of the sun in the galaxy M87, which is about 55 million light years away. Um, so that was quite remarkable. And the Nobel Prize Committee this year honored not just Sir Roger Penrose, but to observational astrophysicists, Andrea Ghez and Reinhard Genzel for observing stars orbiting the black hole at the center of our Milky Way very patiently, literally over decades, and deducing that they were orbiting something invisible, dark, um, very heavy, four million times the mass of the sun, but quite small. And there you have the, uh, the, um, the conclusion that it's a black hole. Uh, just it was just you mentioned um, supermassive black holes because that was one of the things that was I was going to ask you about is is this notion um, it's do we, do we pretty much know for certain that all or at least most galaxies have a supermassive black hole in their center and do we know about the role that they play in gal- galaxy formation? Yeah, we it, it definitely seems to be the case that all conventional galaxies. <laughs> um, have a supermassive black hole at their center. So um, even though they are supermassive, there's still not a huge fraction of the mass of the whole galaxy. There's still much, much, much less than the 300 billion stars bulking up the rest of the Milky Way in terms of mass, um, or, or other galaxies, their number of stars and their masses of their supermassive black holes. But nonetheless, it's becoming clear and clearer that they sculpt the galaxies in some way. Um, that they regulate maybe the shape and the scale and the size, especially in this early active phase when the black holes are taking in a lot of material from the center of the galaxy, creating these jets, which are these kind of magnetic storms or this this twisting of of magnetic fields in the interior and, and funneling matter out on these jets. Those jets can control how much gas allows other stars to form and it can it can really shape and sculpt the galaxy. And I think that's that's still a burgeoning area of research where we're learning more and more. Um, so black holes might have had a lot to do with actually what shaped the universe in the way it did so that we were here to ask these questions. <laughs> uh, yeah, so do, do we know for, for, for certain, or is there a kind of consensus as to whether um, a galaxy exists and a black hole forms at the centre, or whether a galaxy forms around a black hole? There is not a consensus. Um, I really don't think that we fully know the answer to that question. It seems more likely, maybe, that the galaxy formed around the black hole. So... Black holes that massive don't form from stellar collapse, we don't think. Um, But we know they don't directly form from stellar collapse because they're millions and billions of times the mass of our our sun. But you can make uh, black holes 80 times the mass of the sun, 150 times the mass of the sun, just by having collisions of black holes. And then you can kind of accumulate them. And then if you have enough collisions, you eventually make... Um, a really big black hole. If it happens like that, then maybe the galaxy was here first and then the black hole formed. But it doesn't really seem like there's quite enough time. But I, we're, I'm just, I would have to say we're really not sure. So LIGO recently recorded the sound of two black holes colliding in 
a new detection from their original one. And those black holes were pretty heavy to start with. And that really surprised people. And they made a black hole that's, that's probably well over 100 times the mass of the sun. And people didn't think there were black holes in that range. So I would have to say we're just still learning about that. Um, but if, they, if there isn't enough time for them to accumulate through, um, through mergers to a supermassive black hole, then, then you would guess that the galaxy formed around this black hole that actually originated not from stars. It originated some other way in the early universe um, or earlier universe and um, maybe just literally falling out of a, out of a primordial medium and um, and so yeah, I think I think these are things that we're going to answer in the next coming years. Yeah, there was something else you, you touched upon there, and it's the, these idea of the, uh, the ideas of the jets, because I suppose that's another another misconception is that black holes are just these kind of cosmic vacuum cleaners that suck everything up, but but they do they, they do yeah. emit these bright powerful jets, don't they? What, what, yeah. what, what's going on there? Yeah, so black holes, uh, at least classically do not emit anything, including those jets. They create them around them. And that's what the, so the black hole, when it's creating those jets, is borrowing from magnetic fields around them. And the magnetic fields are literally in the goo and the, the, um, the ambient material. And that ambient material could be stars that the black holes destroyed, torn apart, and that's now just a kind of orbiting disk around the black hole. If anyone saw Interstellar, it has uh, in Interstellar, the black hole in that image has an accretion disk. It has a disk around it, a probably torn apart companion star. And... What it what the black hole does is it it spins up these magnetic fields and it creates havoc around it and that's the material that gets spiraled along these magnetic field lines and shot out um, into space. So nothing comes from inside the black hole. That material just never fell inside to begin with. And if I get rid of the material, I, the jets go away. You can't have the jets with the black hole just sitting there by itself. It, is that one one way of sort of um, detecting and observing black holes then? You can actually look out for yeah. the jets? Yeah, it's quite remarkable. We see the jets. It's unbelievable. You can see jets from supermassive black holes that are millions of um, uh, light years across. They Some of them punch into neighboring galaxies. And they, these are not, these are lethal jets. They like, call them, they're like ray guns. So if it punches into a neighboring galaxy, it can actually blow a hole in that galaxy, meaning destroying any planets, any kind of, you know, sentient life out there, like um, clearing out all the stars and the gas. Um, and we also see it on a smaller scale, very similar phenomenon for a small black hole. A lot of stars are formed in pairs. And if one of them becomes a black hole at the end of its lifetime, it can start to tear apart its companion and start to create jets. And so we also see these smaller jets. I just think the um, the the physics and, and the idea behind the whole thing is just, it's incredible and it's absolutely mind-blowing. Um, just, just to finish, it, it, is there... There's obviously a lot left for physicists to learn about black holes, but are there any particular um, unanswered questions regarding black holes that you would like to know the answer to? Yeah, for sure. I mean, they are relentlessly provocative. They really are. That you just they seem to keep um, surprising us. They're as though they're just never going to become a pedestrian phenomenon. <laughs> they're just <laughs> never going to be bland. I think right now what's most interesting to me personally is what they tell us on paper in the mathematics. And, um, and that leads us to Stephen Hawking, who realized that through a very subtle quantum process, a black hole could kind of steal energy from the empty space around it and, um, and thereby radiate and we could talk about that if you like, if you want to go into the details of how that happens. But, but, but it doesn't come from inside the black hole, is what's really spooky about it. It seems to be managing to steal quantum fluctuations out of the vacuum in such a way that, that um, if a pair of particles fluctuates out of the vacuum due to Heisenberg's uncertainty principle about whether things exist or don't exist, one of the companions falls behind the black hole. The other one's now just sitting there stuck. It can't 
it can't disappear without its pair. And so it escapes, shines effectively. And so in this very tricky way, the black hole has started to radiate. Now for big black holes, the sizes of stars, this is incredible, this is much less, um, the, the temperature of this radiation is much less than the temperature of the ambient background. So they're always absorbing, not emitting. We will probably never see this experimentally. But what is really important is what it tells us about um, the aspiration to find a quantum theory of gravity. Because if this is true, and everyone believes that Hawking is right about this, nobody disputes that after 50 years, people are very confident in the calculations and very confident in the idea. The black hole literally evaporates away. It disappears. Eventually, the smaller it gets, the hotter it gets. And it's as though you've yanked up the, the curtain of the event horizon and it explodes. <laughs> but none of that came from inside the black hole. So now quantum physicists um, are running around in a dither because that's not possible in quantum mechanics. For the thing that formed the black hole to simply disappear, it's one thing to hide it behind the event horizon. They could kind of live with that. But to say the event horizon is now gone and I am revealing to you, the universe, that quantum information has disappeared was um, was was completely intolerable to the whole paradigm of quantum mechanics. And again, the whole paradigm of physics, which is saying that, you know, information doesn't disappear. It's the universe is knowable. And if information can just disappear, the universe is unpredictable and unknowable. And so the quantum theorist is, now goes by the title, um, the black hole information loss paradox. The quantum proponents and the relativists found themselves at war. <laughs> about which one was going to survive, quantum mechanics or relativity. And, and so this is one of the most pressing questions in all of fundamental physics. And the black hole is the only terrain we really know of where we can work it out. You know, we explore there mathematically and, and it's giving us clues as to how to understand how quantum mechanics and gravity are going to come together. Um, and some of the ideas are pretty wild right now. Some of the ideas are that there is no such thing as gravity. It's an illusion that what we really have is only quantum mechanics. And from the quantum entanglement, if you can imagine embroidery, imagine I've embroidered something that looks like the event horizon of a black hole. You might from far away think there's a black hole there and there's the event horizon. It's a shadow. I can see the shadow cast. But as you got closer, you would realize it was actually made of these crossing threads. And those crossing threads have to do with quantum entanglement. And so it creates the illusion that there's a single entity in event horizon, but really it emerges from the pattern of the embroidery of the quantum embroidery. And so this is where we are now. <laughs> I, I, I really love that. It's the, the idea. So it's like there's so much that we can see with, you know, the, with the human eye, with like visible light, and then you can go into radio astronomy and x-rays and you can see stuff beyond visible light. But but so much of black hole just, it seems to be kind of hardcore maths on, on paper. Yeah. And just working it all out. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um I mean, definitely. I, I'm not an observer at all. I don't, you know, I love when the observers come back and tell me stuff, but I, um, I'm definitely working it all out in pen on paper. Absolutely. And that's, you know, that's one of the hard parts of that is interpreting your results. And, um, and there have been a lot of really interesting interpretations that were kind of right in front of us for, for decades, but people didn't know how to interpret it. And one of, one of the things, for example, is that it's been known since Hawking um, from other scientists that there's a certain amount of information you can pack in a black hole. And it actually is, it, it grows not with the volume of the black hole, but only with the area of the event horizon. And so people, decades later, starting to think about this, started to call them holograms. They started to think, you know, this is actually very profound. And we, we're acting like it's not a big deal, but it's actually very profound. It means that I can create the illusion of a three-dimensional black hole just by the information I can pack on a two-dimensional surface, which bounds it, the event horizon. And that's what a hologram is. It's like a two-dimensional encoding of information that gives you the illusion of a three-dimensional image. And once they started talking about that, people started saying, well, you know, if I tried to pack more information into a space than that, I would make a black hole. And we know that black holes max out the amount of information they can tolerate 
on their area. So that means the entire world could be a hologram. (laughs) So the entire universe could be a hologram. So these interpretations are not simple. They're not easy. And, um, but when they come, they really are like eye openers. Very dramatic. I think that's a pretty um, <clears throat> mind-blowing place to, to leave the interview, uh, Jan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thanks for having me on. Yeah, I just want to say um, thanks very much for speaking to me today. And good luck with the book when it comes out. And um, hopefully we'll yeah. get, get to speak to you again sometime. Yeah, I really appreciate it. I'm excited. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot.